Major support for the New York Business Report has been provided by New York Community Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns Giatomasi and Webster, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, The Whitkoff Group, Greenberg Traug, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support has been provided by Ackman Zip Real Estate Group, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, C.B. Richard Ellis, Colliers International, NY LLC, Cushman & Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, DDG Partners, Friedman LLP Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Offenides Centurion Holdings, John Castamitidis Red Apple Group, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey and Ackle Realty Services, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, and these friends. Welcome to the New York Business Report. My name is Michael Stoller. The Lower East Side, a place where immigrants came, the place where people were there in the early 1900. Today, companies still survive, and some companies even have third, fourth, and fifth generation over there. So today, I've assembled these three individuals who are continuing their business in the Lower East Side. My guests include Nikki Russ Fetterman, who is with Russ and Daughters. We don't have any appetizing, but we have Nikki over here today. <laughs> we have Aaron Gross from Streitz Matzah, also Aaron Streitz and Company, but we don't have any matzah from him. Last but not least, we have David Zarin, and also we have no fabrics over here, but we're okay. So you are, you're the kid. You're only, you're the third generation. You are the fourth generation, and you are the fifth generation. But the interesting situation is, even though you are the fifth generation, their company started a little earlier in the Lower East Side. Okay, right? It was in 1907 that, uh, you know, great-grandpa over there, Joel Russ, was on a, a peddling on a push cart. Mm -hmm. But you had relatives who really came over in 1896 right. over there. But then they really stayed, and they went to Pitt Street and they, over there. And then you're the kid, 1936, right? You know, with right. some fabrics. So how does a girl who went to Amherst, a guy who went to Georgetown, and another one, the Tulane, decide to go into the business. Why do you continue on? What, what creates that impetus to go into the business, Mr. Zarin? Coming from a multi-generational business uh, and growing up in the business, I think you have to have a passion for the business in one way or another. The passion could be for the business itself. The passion could be for uh, continuing the legacy, which was one of the main reasons uh, why You're I- You gonna follow it. Harry? I wanted to follow Harry, my grandfather. He was a, a great guy. Everybody in my business, uh, you know, has great stories about him. There, it was called the School of Harry Zarin. There are so many businesses still around today that were started by people who worked for my grandfather, Harry. Now, you, you know, your family, you know, you're the fifth generation. But you, you grew up, you weren't really over here. You were in Maryland a number of years. Yeah, I grew years. up in New York City, but I was, I was up here all the time so, for holidays. So you were over here to yeah. cut matzo, you know, to, I was up to, and I was touring to make sure here. that it was less than 18 minutes? That, you exactly. know, okay, you, you know, 18, 18, minutes, 18 right. minutes over there. Now, how many generations, uh, how many other uh, fifth generations are in the business? You said to me you have the fourth generation. Yeah, there's no other fifth generations in the business now. Uh, I have my two cousins and I run the day-to-day -day operations. I concentrate on sales. One cousin does, you know, factory, uh, and the other one does a lot of purchasing and um, you know, finance. Did you think, you know, you were talking to me about your grandfather and your father. They, you know, they were in the business, but they were also the, in the training of horses business over there. Did you think when you were growing up that you'd be going into this business? Uh, no, it, was, it always interests me. Uh, I mean, my father didn't live in Manhattan as, w as well as at the time when I was growing up. Uh, but like I said, I always come up here and, and see my grandmother, my, my great grandparents, and I would always spend a lot of time in the business. I'd work in the little retail store we had on the corner. Uh, so I was always fascinated with the business. Uh, but I did grow up, like you said, very far removed. Uh, had a little stint 
working uh, on the racetrack out of college. Um, then moved my way up to New York. And uh, a lot of it, like you said, it's, it's carrying on a tradition. Um, it's, a, it's the legacy of the business. We, uh, our business, we're so entrenched in the Lower East Side. We've been here for so many years. It's something uh, we plan on being here for many, many more years to come. But uh, it's just a special thing to be a part of something so iconic. We're going to get back to you in a second. But now, you were talking about there's a retail business segment. But your retail business is a seasonal. You know, some tourists right. come by, they go in, they buy some matzo or something else. But that's, take, that's how we started, really. Right. right? But that's, they take pictures of the facility. Right. Here is a person who's literally in retail. Right. I mean, she used to even live in the building on top <laughs> of, the, of the retail store right. over there. So, you know. Classic, right? Classic. The shopkeeper uh, above uh, the uh, store. Uh, I mean, <laughs> this way you didn't have to worry. You know, you could always go down. and. I know, had no excuse to be late. Yeah. Th that's right. You had yeah. no excuse. But it's difficult to be in retail. Retail, very hard for generations yeah. to continue right. business. Okay, he's in retail, but a different type of retail. Uh, and he's six days. You're seven days a week. You know, it's a different retail. It's a hard situation. How uh, you know, retail is, it is hard. But I think that what um, the space of Russ and Daughters, the fact that we've been on the Lower East Side this in, for 100 years and that people come there, not, not just to buy their smoked salmon and herring and caviar and babka, but because there is that physical space, there is the retail space where they can have an experience um, that uh, connects them to their own life history. You know, whether it's because their grandparents, grandparents used to come to us and daughters or because they used to live in New York years ago and now they're just a visitor. Um, so the hard work of having a retail retail store is um, uh, worth it for me to be able to um, keep a, a place as special as Russ and Daughters uh, there for the public and to have them engage with, you know, this tr food tradition. But you have people who, who aren't, you know, I mean, I, I was watching a video when I was doing some research on the show, some lady from London who was doing, uh, who was involved with the Bowery Hotel, and she was talking about the schmear and all the rest going over there. I mean, you, you know, Russ and Daughters, you know, especially with PBS and other situations, you, you know, the, there's a history, the same way with Strites and the same way with Zarin. So you've mm -hmm. got, there, there's people come there not only because they're relatives or something else, but you're also a different type of institution. At one time, they were appetizing stores all over. That's How many appetizing stores are today? You can count them on one hand. You know, Russ and, I mean, that's another reason why it's such a pilgrimage place now, because, um, like you said, the Lower East Side alone used to have 30 appetizing stores. Um, today, we're one of the last uh, of our kind, and um, it's, appetizing is one of New York's most original food traditions. And as people become more aware of that, they want to come and they want to have a real New York experience and eat kind of classic New York food. In a similar manner, you know, matzahs, and you very, I, I tell the story about the great grandparents because there, are, there were a couple of kosher companies, uh, Manischewitz, Goodman. Tell me about what you told me before about the relatives, your great- I was telling you about my grandfather, Aaron yeah. Gross, who, I, who I'm named for. He had uh, five brothers. And uh, he was the youngest of five, and his older brothers, one of them married B. Monashevitz, who was owner, owned Monashevitz, of course, and the other one married uh, Horowitz, a girl from Horowitz. So we had daughter. three matzo companies. Yeah, so when he came home with Muriel Strait, you know, his parents were like, ah, oh, there's no way, you're, you're just messing with this, but yeah, that was my So, so at, the, at, the, at the Passover Seder, there would be three boxes of matzo? They always had to have them all out there, yes. And, you, and basically, they kept them in the boxes as opposed to being the table, so they could see. So he had to show that, yeah. They yeah. said that everyone else, okay. Yeah. Here, here's the question. How do you grow this business to the sixth generation? How do you grow this to the fifth? You have that one-year-old, you know, over there. You know, he's, he's going to learn. Okay, I can see she, him. She, she. Russ and uh, daughters. Uh, Russ. I had to have a daughter. <laughs> Very well done. <laughs> Wait a second. Your cousin. You, you know, your cousin, oh, the yeah. engineer, is over there in the business. And how do you, you have two kids, so, you know, they, how do you get them over there? How do you, how do you build in this feeling that they should grow and they should feel this, this heritage that you, all three of you, seem to have about your business? Uh, we, I mean, we like growth, of course, every, every business does, but we try to really um, concentrate on our roots and just continue to make a good quality product. I think there's things that set us apart. There's an authenticity about the three of us, basically. You know, we're still, 
where we began on the Lower East Side. We're still family owned, family run. Uh, we make things very, the old, we're very old fashioned, very antiquated in the way we uh, manufacture matzo from, there's three, I think there's three things that set us apart. The New York City water, everybody talks about the bagel, the pizza is better in New York City. Probably has something to do with the water. Uh, we have a very old fashioned way of actually sheeting the dough, uh, overlap the dough eight times, four times each direction. And we have a very old fashioned uh, oven, a convection oven that it kind of rolls through. We have two, two of them, one on the third floor, one on the first floor. Uh, and then everything's done by hand when it comes out of the oven. So it's a very labor-intensive, antiquated, antiquated way to do, to actually manufacture this product. Um, but I think it gives it a quality and authenticity that can't be uh, recreated in a new facility. Plus, Passover is a tradition-based tradition holiday. We can actually give you the same matzo you had 50 years ago. Right, but you, had on but you know what? Table. Your business, even though it's Passover, it's a 12-month 12, 12 year of business, of the same thing. How do, how do you, now, even though you're, Years ago, you know, when your father went into the business, when your uh, father and your uncles were in the business, and your, your, your dad, the neighborhood was a little rustic. That was a nice way to say things about it. You know, they were, uh, you know, you'd walk down, there may have been some drugs on the corner, the needles and other yeah, situation. Tough. Now you're in a gentrified neighborhood. You know, you've spent time, you were in the real estate business. You're still in the real estate business. Can, what happens if the neighborhood says, you know, we don't need any more, you know, there's no, no need for three fabric stores over there. I mean, you know, like 30 appetizing stores. You know, you get priced out. I mean, you own your building, you own your property, you're a tenant over there. Can Zarin Fabrics grow to the fourth generation by being in the D&D &D building or being, you know, somewhere else? So um, Zarin Fabrics, is a destination. We have a, a big warehouse. We are known for being on the Lower East Side for decades. Um, we have uh, a staff that is highly knowledgeable. Average uh, longevity. Longevity. Thank you. Of my staff is about twenty years. Um, we offer great service, like my my grandfather Harry. Uh, that was a, a main point of his to offer great service at a time. But, but wait, you can still when, offer that service when, if you were at the D and D building. That's right. So, so this is my point. My point is, uh, we could continue doing that and we could sustain ourselves. But uh, the market has changed a lot. Back up until the '90s, every store in Grand Street was a store like mine, very similar. Uh, now, not so much. So we are looking at different things. You mentioned the D&D &D building, 200 Lex. Uh, I think there is uh, opportunities for us there um, to offer some of our custom services while still maintaining a, a, a foothold on the Lower East Side with our fabric warehouse, which is what we're so well known for. Now people go, you know, people still, you know, all generations, you know, because you're in your 30s, but people in their 30s, 40s, 20s, go down to the Lower East Side and they want to get fabrics and some of them want to get matzah and then everybody wants to get locks because they'll know you slice it as long as I don't slice it because otherwise they <laughs> won't ever go to Russ and Daughters again. But what happens, you know, gentrification is great for the city but gentrification could one day change well, things. I think actually um, what the changes on the Lower East Side have, I mean, have certainly been good for, for Russ and Daughters. Why? Well, you know, in the 70s and 80s, uh, we didn't have a local base of customers. Our customers had to come make, uh, take a trip to Russ and Daughters from Uptown or Long Island. Um, now we have locals who come in, you know, in the morning and get their, their bagel and their coffee on, the way, on their way to work. Um, so, and the, but the other reason that the changes have been good is maybe in a way that people haven't thought about. And it's sort of bittersweet because the the more that the neighborhood um, uh, loses, you know, every time a, a t classic tenement building comes down and maybe a sh glass new building goes up, or you know, we lose a, a small business to a large chain that comes in, places like Russ and Daughters or Strites or Zarens become that much more meaningful uh, to people because they are just fewer. Uh, unique, characteristically New York places to go to. Um, and people are searching for that. And so, you know, it's kind of um, 
uh, it's helped us, but it, in a way, there's something, it, it's come at a cost. But, but couldn't we, you know, in the same manner, couldn't we see, I was in Denver last weekend, uh, and I'm there, and I walk into um, the supermarket, not Whole Foods, which we'll get to in a different way, and I walk in, and I see this Murray cheese. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, I know Murray cheese, you know, it's from New York, and over there. Couldn't I see a Russ and Daughters in, in a supermarket, you know, um, in, a, in a different place, yeah. okay? And we get asked... Um, Couldn't I see a Zarin, you know, in, uh, in a boutique of a Gracious Homes or a boutique of a Bed Bath & Beyond? Or like, you know, what JCPenney is doing today, creating boutiques within their store, mm -hmm. you know, with Levi Strauss right. over there? Look, we can also have the matzah over there, you know, a certain section of Whole Foods, you know, right. if it's organic, okay? We have to have organic matzah over here. We have it. And, and we, for, I mean, I certainly get pitched these ideas on a daily basis, you know? You know, come uptown, move to, you know, open up in L.A., uh, the idea you mentioned. Um, I mean, I even have someone the other day wanted, wants to open, wants me to open Russ and in the Mountains of Switzerland. So if, nice. you know, I think for me what's fascinating about running this business is that I am always sort of tempering growth with, whole, with maintaining the integrity of tradition and maintaining an authentic experience. And, and so... You know, uh, I think that really informs and sort of shapes my um, view of how I want to grow the business. Because if I just wanted to have a hundred Russ and Daughters by now, I, I, you know, we could have done that. But it's, you know, we feel very strongly that the the integrity of what we do, a lot of it has to come from the fact that um, it's uh, it's unique. And once you try to replicate yourself endlessly, you you know, you lose. You lose yeah, something yeah. There. All three of you also have another situation besides generations. All of you are involved with the Lower East Side bid, the business development improvement. You really feel close to that. I think you're an officer. I think you're, yes. you're all officers over there. How do you, why do you get involved with the bid? Why do you think the bid is valuable for the community? The reason I'm involved with the bid is because I want to better the neighborhood. And I think especially over the last five years, we've done a fabulous job. The Lower East Side had become known for its nightlife. It had a lot of bars, a lot of restaurants, a lot of people from all over the city were coming to Lower East Side to enjoy those establishments. But there wasn't a lot of daytime foot traffic, which is something that all of us need to help out our businesses. And that's why I got involved. And we've done a lot. We've cleaned up the area. Orchard Street, as many people know, uh, was closed on Sundays. It still is closed on Sundays, but it wasn't the same. It used to be a bustling area of commerce, and it became pathetic. You mean close to cars? Close to cars. Close, thank you. Close to cars. And um, we decided to have an event there. We called it Day Life, as opposed to Night Life. And it was a huge success. It's something that the city is now going to use as a model for all of its fairs going forward across the city. Uh, we had badminton, we had croquet, we had all of the great merchants. I think uh, Nikki Daughters. was there uh, with Russ and Daughters. And this is something that we're going to continue doing from April through October, uh, one, one day a month. And um, it's kind of like the urban backyard of the Lower East Side. I'm I'm involved uh, because I my family's had a, a vested interest in the low, on the Lower East Side for a hundred years. We were there, you know, uh, through the Depression, the wars, uh, you know. Look, the recession. every and relative, so, you know, everybody who got married, the, the 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 uncles had to go into the business. That was part of the deal, right? That's right. And so, you know, I want to see that the Lower East Side develops, it, and 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 also. Stay. It's one, the Lower East Side is one of the most historically rich neighborhoods in our country, and so it's very exciting to have this mix of businesses and young people and nightlife, and but also to maintain uh, the integrity of uh, of our our own history. Um, so it's it, for me, it's fascinating to just be connected to the political side of it, the business side, the, hear what the residents have to say. So he, here's a question. What happened? One of the biggest problems. I have a, a dear friend who takes care of next generation planning. 
it's very difficult to plan to, 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 to grow that next generation, the transition. How was it to transition from your father, okay, who's the second generation, your fifth generation, and how hard is it, you know, especially when the, the family is alive and they're looking at you and they're saying to you, maybe, you know, this is how you should run the business or something like that. How, how do you see that? I mean, your dad's still active, not in the business. You know, he has a book coming out. Right. Hopefully we'll have him on my show, my building show, to talk about his book. But how, how, how difficult was it? And then you had a cousin who came out of here from engineering, you know, mm -hmm. making little transistors, you know. Now he has to cut locks and smoke fish, okay? Um, I mean, it's, I don't think it's ever easy. Um, I think what enables a family business to go to the next generation is when the, the, the next generation chooses to take that business on. Um, and for me, it's also a, moment, a question of timing. Uh, at one point, my father was ready to pass it on to me, and I wasn't ready. Um, so I needed a few more years to go and do other things professionally, know what, know all the different paths my life could have taken um, to then be able to say, oh, yes, I want to come on board and Russ and Daughters is what I want to do. Um, and then, you know, there is, when we actually got into the nitty gritty of succession planning, it's, it is challenging because you're, it's, um, you're dealing with uh, not just a business, it's not a, just a business, it's a, it's you know, your life work, it's your, your identity. Um, and, uh, but, but luckily we, I think, are in a great spot because my cousin and I now own and run the business, but uh, my father and my mother who was involved um, are still here and we can go to them with questions. They have a historical perspective. But, but you own the business and you're running the business. Yes. And that's the decision. What yes. about your business? Uh, like, like you said, it is difficult to you know go from generation to generation. Um, I did it uh, very ground up way. I worked every, in every spot in this factory. I worked uh, in the warehouse out in Jersey. Uh, worked my way up. Uh, uh, worked with the sales manager we had at the time. Um, and now I run the sales and marketing. Uh, but the, yeah, you were speaking to the elder generation, and you know they get stuck in their ways, and they don't want things to change. But we actually. We have, we're very active in our shareholder meetings, our board meetings, bringing in, you know, my grandmother used to go, my, my great aunt. But what about your cousins? Are they in the business? Or are they yeah, but I have two cousins that are very active. I mean, I just do the sales side. They do, they do other aspects of the company. So they're all, all three very active uh, in the business, and, and we get along well. They're, they're a separate generation. It's not really a... Now, what's happened in your business, you know, Manischewitz was acquired by a conglomerate. A number of these companies are acquired by a conglomerate, you know, or take in your business, you can follow the fairway situation mm -hmm. that you take one store and you get a, p right. a private equity right. fund and they increase it over right. here. And it could be the same way, especially, you know, because you went to uh, NYU for your master's, you might want to grow over there. Uh, how, how do you look at those things for the next generation? Or is that a, a growth plan? Do you think we could see more Zarens around the country the same way that we spoke about that? Can we have baking of matzah? It doesn't, you know, they're big communities, Jewish communities all around. We can have one in Los Angeles, you know, we can have one in Miami, you know, but that's, you know, there are different things. Uh, with my business, I don't think you're going to see more Zarin fabrics uh, as far as what we're known for, our fabric warehouse, where we have thousands of bolts of fabric on racks, on display. It's a, it's a very inventory intensive business. Can I have a little swatch? You know, I don't need you. Know, well, you know, I think. Uh, should give me a little piece of lox. You know, I'll take a swatch <laughs> the same way. Next time I'll bring you a swatch. Okay. <laughs> but um, I think branding is probably the way to go if we're going to uh, expand and grow out of the New York City area. Um, you know, I was talking with, with Carrie Kravit, who owns Kravit Fabrics, one of the, the largest and most well known companies and he's done a great job with that business. Uh, if we grow, I think it would have to be something similar to what the Kravitz did as far as putting together uh, lines of fabric, branding at Zarin, and selling through showrooms across the country. You? We're going to stay where we are. We're going to have one matzo factory. One, but wait, <laughs> but, but, but you know, we were talking before. Now, you know, everybody wants gluten-free. It's difficult to get the gluten, but you got spats, you know, and then you sell macaroons, and then you sell spices. We have, we have expanded. The matzo, the matzo derivatives are all out of its original factory downtown. 
We, we have a warehouse out in Jersey where we make macaroons, cookies, mandel cuts, all our dry mixes and things like that. But we're not going to, uh, I don't think we're going to be open up factories all over Now, do, do, you, uh, do, do you smoke downstairs? I mean... No, um, actually, the, it's, there's an old law in the books that uh, prohibits the smoking of fish in Manhattan. Uh -huh. um, but the, we're, Russ and Daughters is actually going to be uh, expanding um, in, a, in a very local, hyper-local way. We are um, going to be opening a couple of new businesses on the Lower East Side. What type of business? Uh, we're opening. We're going to be opening um, our own bagel operation. So we're we're going to have a uh, a bagel factory that's going to be on view for people to come and watch, and bring back the real artisanal craft of making. Bagels, and we're also gonna have a cafe. It's the water. It's the water. It's the you water. Know. I know. That's he knows it's the water. They so, can't. That's the way. Um, and we're gonna have a Russ and Daughters cafe, so people can actually come and have Russ and Daughters in a sit-down uh, manner. So even though our retail store is very small, our, we're gonna be branching out in the neighborhood. I can't believe how much fun I've had talking about the Lower East Side. Following up on where second, no, no more second, third, fourth, fifth, and hopefully the sixth generation over there. And I'd like to thank all of you for being at the New York Business Report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great time.